And greetings. Happy Thursday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast alongside Todd Erzin and Aaron McIntyre. I'm Steve Dace. This is the Steve Day Show brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company, the Christian owned Patriot Coffee Company that doesn't just share your values, but makes some outstanding coffee as well. If you want to try it for yourself, the roast on date is right there. And on the bag, they ship it within days of being roasted, so you get it as fresh as absolutely possible. So many great flavors to choose from. You can go to firstcup.com, use code DACE, save an additional 10% on your order if you go there. And if you subscribe, you save an additional 10% for the life of your subscription. Firstcup.com, promo code DACE is where you want to go. That's firstcup.com, promo code DACE to get those discounts. Coming up on the show today, bottom of the hour. We're going to talk to somebody who is attempting to do something to truly test and then also maybe even install uh, a biblical worldview back into the country. And since the biblical worldview thing happens to be the prime directive of this show from the day it launched, it seems a conversation that we should be willing to have. So we will hear at the bottom of the hour. He's got a worldview test. I took it last night. Okay. And I'm going to get into how I scored and everything on it. I had, and I want to discuss this with our guest at the bottom of the hour. I had some issues with the questions. And the issues I had with them were not the questions, but the era in which we live. Like, well, yeah, that's absolutely what should happen. But do I want the people in charge and the generation in charge to be responsible for making those things happen. Do you see what I'm saying? And so that made me a little bit like squeamish on a few of the questions, for lack of a better term. You, 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 you answer strongly agree, agree, neutral, tend to disagree, strongly mm-hmm. disagree. There were several that I would, that if, if things were the way maybe they're supposed to be, I would have entered a strongly agree, but I'm like... <sighs> Oh, I agree, but who would I ask to? Who's in charge right now in either party right now? Is Chip Roy in charge? Well, but if things were the way they were supposed to be, we'd be the lot closer that, that, to having a biblical worldview to begin with. That's the conundrum. That's my point. Yes. I mean, Chip Roy's not in charge, right? Thomas Massey's not in charge, right? Okay. Right. We have a couple of states where good people are in charge. We live in one of them. But for the most part, our people are not in charge, like literally anywhere. So do I want... Do I want there are people doing these things because I'm inclined to think they'll be inclined to take our premise and aim it right back at us. You see what I'm saying? Sure. And so I would love to discuss this with him in the next segment on, I totally agree, but, but now we're in the real world. (laughs) Okay. So we'll get into that conversation at the bottom of the hour. Um, One of the reasons that uh, I had difficulty answering some of the questions on this biblical worldview test, uh, just open demonic, uh, openly demonic influence in the culture. And that's why we're going to continue our Bible study on know thy enemy, looking at spiritual warfare coming up in the next hour of the show. Then my oldest daughter, Anastasia will join us for three non-political questions. But before we get to all those things, let's begin as we always do. Here's Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by what was that? The mobile phone network AT&T suffered a massive reported nationwide outage overnight and into this morning. Absolutely no reason has been given from the company as to why that happened. According to the website Down Detector, it wasn't just AT&T. Numerous major telecom and internet companies reported outages in the past 12 hours, including Google, Verizon, T-Mobile and many others. That's weird. Joe Biden formally announced his plan to forgive another 150,000 student loans yesterday and said the Supreme Court can pound sand. Early in my term, I announced a major plan to provide millions of working families with debt relief for their college student debt. Tens of millions of people in debt were literally about to be canceled, their debts. But my MAGA Republican friends in the Congress, elected officials and special interests stepped in and sued us. And the Supreme Court blocked it and blocked it. But that didn't stop me. I announced we were going to pursue alternative paths for student debt relief. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is, what judicial supremacy? 
According to new documents, we now know Joe Biden's old dog, Commander, bit Secret Service agents on at least 24 different occasions before he was removed from the White House. Kamala Harris, your thoughts? Are you capable? Are you ready to step into the role and do whatever the I'm country would need? absolutely ready. But... Thank God our president is in good shape and good health. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis says he will sign a bill into law in his state that will publish Jeffrey Epstein's grand jury documents from his 2006 case. The bill expands the rules for allowing the release of evidence or testimony from a grand jury. At the time, Epstein escaped with a far less severe punishment relating to allegations regarding his solicitation of minors for sex. We'll see what the grand jury saw back nearly 20 years ago. Check out this headline from The Blaze. Seattle's pro-Palestinian supporters appear to declare homosexual intifada following pro-Hamas rally. Okay, I'm gonna give you to the count of five to determine either A, are pro-Hamas orcs declaring an intifada against homosexuals, or B, are pro-Hamas homosexuals declaring an intifada against the Jews. Ready? One, two, three, four, five. If you guessed B, homosexuals are declaring an intifada against the Jews, you're correct, I think. Activists in Seattle have plastered city property with posters declaring a gay uprising following a march in support of Gaza's ruling government, Hamas. Posters with homosexual intifada on them have been widely circulated online, originating from Seattle. The posters also showed what appear to be two men kissing, wearing keffiyehs, headcloths for men, typically worn in the Middle East. The men's faces were covered. It's unclear whether the signage is parody or genuine. Donald Trump held a town hall on Fox News this week, and Laura Ingram asked him about who he'd consider to be his running mate. This is the first time in our recollection, at least recently, that Trump has talked at any length about his potential VP choice, which is why we're including it on the montage today. Ingram asked him about Vivek Ramaswamy, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Byron Donalds, Tulsi Gabbard, and Christy Noem. Here's how Trump responded. And honestly, all of those people are good. They're all good. They're all solid. And I always say, I want people with common sense because there's so many things happening in this country that don't make sense. Who wants an open border? Who wants high interest rates? Who wants all electric vehicles? And they're fine, but you want to have choice. You want to go to combustion. You want to go to uh, the, any hybrid. I think the hybrid are much better from that standpoint. But you talk, we were talking about faucets. We're talking about, we're talking about so much. It's all based on common sense. We want a strong military. We want choice in education. We want to have things that can really make our country great again. What we're doing with the open border is a disaster. We are destroying our country. We're going to change that fast, and we're going to get your energy prices down. Mr. President, thank you so much for this. And finally, Pastor John MacArthur addressed Pastor Alistair Begg's recent advice that sometimes it's okay for Christians to attend so-called gay or trainee weddings. But he was making the argument that you go out of compassion rather than condemnation. You, you go to show love to them as a means to reach them. My, my response to that is the most loving thing you could possibly do would be not to go and to condemn the relationship. That is loving. It's not loving to help somebody celebrate stepping into the fury of God's judgment. No, no transgender person effeminate homosexual will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is not a time for you to celebrate thinking that your affection for somebody is the means of their salvation. They, they will come to salvation when the Lord exposes their sin. That's why the Holy Spirit, John 16, convicts of sin and righteousness and judgment. And what should be said to somebody is this is wrong, this is against God's order, this is not marriage. It is not a marriage because you can't have a marriage between two people of the same sex. It's not a marriage at all. It is defying God who ordained marriage and ordained male and female and designed procreation. It is a blasphemy against God, as is transgender life and homosexuality as well. That is the message to give in love. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's montage brought to you by our friends over at Birch Gold. If you just watched that montage, then you know there's a lot of instability happening. All right. Uh, so here's a question. Have you sheltered your retirement 
provided we can still have one of those. Uh, your savings, your investments in uh, p- to avoid potential ma- major setbacks in the economy. Uh, it's not too late to do that, to di- diversify with an old your old IRA or 401k into one with gold and do it with our friends at Birch Gold Group. They can help you with that because as opposed to many other investments, gold thrives in times of uncertainty. And it's an important part of diversifying your savings. Here's how Birch Gold can help you make it gold a part of yours. Uh, they'll help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax sheltered IRA in gold and it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Just text Steve to 989-898 for a free info kit with an A-plus rating from the Better Business Bureau. Countless five-star reviews. Thousands of happy customers. You can't beat it. Uh, go right now. Text Steve to 989-898 to get your free info kit on gold from Birch Gold. Text Steve today at 989-898. In the overtime today, we are going to discuss what may happen as a result of Florida releasing the full documentation of its first uh, investigation at Epstein about 20 years ago. This was during the Bush administration, if I recall. Uh, We'll discuss what the outcome and what could be in there might be. I will tell you, um, I did check yesterday. Ron DeSantis is not suicidal. Uh, has, has, he, he's in a good stage of life right now, um, and there are he has no ideations or any plans to kill himself. I think we should go ahead and put that marker down. Good baseline. Um, and, and I was also, I did ask a little birdie, hey, can you give me a heads up on what's in there? You know, is this going to be newsworthy or not? And here's what I was told at a very, not from the governor himself, but pretty high level of Florida government. I was told directly, none of us, including the governor, are allowed to see these until he signs the law and they're unsealed. So we have no idea. None of us have a clue what's in any of these. So think about that as we discuss that today in the overtime at blazetv.com slash days for blaze tv subscribers blazetv.com slash days we'll upload it there for you later today we'll record it right after today's show you can also go there if you're not yet a subscriber and would like to become one at just uh, about 10 bucks a month blazetv.com slash days all right a couple of things to address um in aaron's uh montage i want to talk about i want to talk about the outage and then I, I want to talk about uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna agree with Joe Biden. I mean I I kinda think I, I kinda think I have to. We'll get into that in a minute. Let's start with the outage. I don't want to get into I, I couldn't Snapchat, I, I couldn't you know, sexed my ninth, you know, Tinder date. All the, I don't want to get into most of the reasons people had a, are having meltdowns about this today. Because, yes, we are soft. Yes, we are shallow. And yes, we are a people that largely serves no purpose, to paraphrase the late, great Robin Williams from Good Morning Vietnam. All right. I want to tell you what my initial reaction was to this. And I want you to—I t- want you guys to tell me if there's something wrong with me or not. Okay. My initial reaction to this was to see where the outages have occurred, and immediately think to myself, "Oh, these are these are all red states. This is red state America that's having an outage. You know, the people that own most of the guns." People that could actually, should there be like a Red Dawn scenario, would actually be in a position to push back on a domestic militia level, molecular level? Is there something wrong with me that when I heard about this outage, well, first thing I did was check to see if it applied to us here, and I saw I had service up here. But that was the first thought that I had. No, no. both issues are the two sides of the same coin. They wouldn't try this if we weren't soft. But because we are, yeah, they're absolutely capable and willing of trying this. 
Aaron? That softness that Todd talked about, I mean, up and down the top 25 trending in the United States this morning were just diff different permutations of people outraged that their internet service, that their phone service was down. I mean, there were probably half of the top 25 list this morning was all about this outage. But yeah, no, that's... You never know what day you're going to wake up yeah. and, oh, hey, Iranian... Um, Today's the day. Today's the day, yeah. All right. The Iran, China, Russia, any of them. All right. I just want to do a self-check on that. All right. So, okay, let's move on. There's one other thing in your montage I want to talk about before I get to. Learning Biden today, that is, uh, I think I might agree with Joe Biden on something. Okay. Trump did not say anything specific as Aaron you noted in your montage about these six names that Laura Ingram threw out um, other than to give them a generic seal of approval I actually thought the messaging that he did afterwards talking about common sense I actually thought that was very good messaging and I thought it was actually very well delivered try to stick with that I'll let that go but I liked it I just, I'm not trying to fix anything. I'm not. These are mere suggestions. And I thought it was very good messaging. And I, I would humbly appreciate it if we could just stay on that. <laughs> Adorable. I know. I know. But I just wanted to put that stake in the ground. It's a little stake. It's barely above the ground, in fact. It's, it's a un poquito. But I just needed to do it. Let's get to the names. All right. If you look at Trump's hiring pattern, there are there are two common th three things that you see in common. Male or female um can hold their own on television. That's a big thing for Trump. And frankly that's a big thing in general. We live in a media age, right? All right, that's a big thing, all right? Um the women have to be hot and the men have to be betas. This is a, these are three things you see, all right? And then when they hire a, a guy that's not a beta named Scott Atlas, they give him a stapler, put him in the far hallway and say, you, got, you go get him, kid, go figure it out, right? I mean, if you're good at that, if you're going to have a prominent role in the Trump administration, you've got to be good on TV. If you're a chick, you got to be hot. And if you're a dude, you got to shut your hole and know your role. You got to know. There's only one, only, only, only one, you know, rooster in the hen house. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Trump's the ancient ruler that makes sure all the guys in his court are eunuchs because only one seed's getting deposited into this harem and it's mine. Fair? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, anybody, you guys want to dispute those three qualifications? No. Okay. Got to no. be good on TV, male or female, got to be good on TV. If you're a hot chick, you got to be hot. And if you're a dude, you've got to be compliant and subservient and willing to debase yourself in expressing that. Fair? And you wanted them to stay with quality messaging. I just, I thought it was quality messaging and I liked it. <laughs> All right. So let's go through these three, it's these six names and see if they meet your, if they meet that three criteria. All right. Tim Scott. Good on TV. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, willing to debase himself. Slobber. Yeah. So yeah. you guys think he would be on a legit short list then? Yeah. Okay. Ron DeSantis. No. No, I agree. No. Yeah. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Yes. Yeah. Good on TV. We, we definitely know he's good on TV. Definitely even more than that. No, he's willing to debase himself. And you, and, and is he shameless enough to just have no male ego at all? You know, just be a, the, the Hindu Mike Pence. Is he shameless enough to do that, basically? Yes. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Uh, Byron Donalds. Now, let me put a caveat, by the way. I should have done this at the start. We're not sure like all these people would even pass like a background vetting. And from what I'm told, not every name on this list would. Okay. But you know, that those are caveats that we're not aware of. We're just going with the generic list that Laura Ingram threw out and, and, and Trump broadly commented on. So put that disclaimer out there. Byron Donalds. Good on TV. Yeah. 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 Okay. Willing to debase and humiliate himself on behalf of Donald definitely, Trump? Probably, yeah. I mean, we saw this last spring, right? Yeah. He went out and actually tried to call Ron DeSantis a racist over yeah. the, the the history standards that he was all for yeah. before he endorsed Trump for president, right? right? Okay. So we think he might be on a short list then. Yeah. Again, pending that all these people could pass vettings. We don't know that. 
Tulsi Gabbard. Good on TV? Yep. Hot? Yeah. Hot? Yeah. Okay. If you're a woman around Trump, you get to have strong opinions. You get to be independent. The guys don't. The women get to be independent and have strong opinions. The guys do not. Okay. So we don't have to go to the third place with her. You know, she can have, you know, as a woman, as a hot chick, she can have any opinion she wants in the Trump fiefdom provided just at the end, you know, she signs off on whatever Trump does. But that's part of being VP for anybody. Anybody's VP is going to be asked to do that in any party in any era. Okay. So, uh, Tulsi, she's that, that last part willing to sign off on anything. I don't think so. No, I don't think so. What if I told you she was doing a fundraiser at Mar-a-Lago here? Oh, I, I think she's willing to sign off on anything. So I, I, but I think she's on the list. She, she only has to hit the first two anyway. Hot chick. Good on TV. There's an added bonus. Uh, I didn't leave the Democrat Party. The Democrat there you go. Party left me. And and I I could see her being a, a, a not just in physical appearance, but in narrative more so, as you pointed out, Aaron, as your emissary to the uh, the suburban women for the election. You sent her there to live there, basically. Um, Christy Noem. We no, know she she's would, no, all she of the would boxes. sign off on anything. Yeah. Okay. So we actually think of the six names that Laura Ingram brought up. As a as a as a show panel here, we actually think five of them are legit serious candidates then. Which is pretty good for Laura Ingram to pick six names and you and, and, and the three of us put it together and we think five of them are legit. Kevin. And the only reason that the other one's not legit is just because he, we just don't think he'll play ball at a certain level. Right. Like I don't I don't see Ron DeSantis castrating himself so that, you know, only one guy is putting his seat in the harem. I don't, I don't see him being that guy, you know, so and and I don't and, and he's he he is trying to disqualify himself if we're all being honest. I mean, Ron is doing everything he can publicly to basically don't call me. OK, so um, the other five, five out of six, those are pretty good. That's a pretty good job by Laura Ingram then. Yeah. OK, mm-hmm. so over under 50 percent that when Trump chooses a running mate. It is one of those five names. Tim Scott, over. Vivek Ramaswamy, Byron Donalds, yep. Tulsi Gabbard, or Christine Ohm. Over. Over 50. I agree. Okay. Um, That's why I'm not that impressed. I mean, I don't think it was that big of a reach. Checking all the race and gender boxes, and if he's not going to go DeSantis, set aside whether DeSantis wants it or not. Um, which, which would be the obvious choice of un- uniting in a party to the extent that you could. He's, he's either going to go black or he's going to go woman. Okay. All right. I've put this off long enough. This is... This is the bane of having principles. But guys, I, I think I have to side with Joe Biden on this one. At least the principle, not its application. Okay. Like the lawlessness is not that Joe Biden is trying to circumvent the Supreme Court, an unelected body that is given no legislative or statutory power by the Constitution, not one word or syllable of it. I've seen plenty of people on the right or the libertarian right, whatever you want to call it, making this claim. That's there's no lawlessness to be found there. There is no power of statute from the Supreme Court. Their words do not have the force of law. They advise and consent. Has the sergeant of arms arrested Joe Biden this morning? That has not happened. No. Did the marshal of the Supreme Court march in to arrest Joe Biden this morning? No? No. It just has the... <laughs> Aaron's laughing. Is the National Guard circling... The white, well, they are, and it's because of that damn dog, okay? But is it because Joe Biden has told the court to take a flying leap? No. No. Which implies the court is not allowed to do what? Act. They can't act. They're given our, neither force nor will. Another word for force and will, by the way, would be a synonym of force and will. Act. That'd be another, that'd be another word for it. That's not the lawlessness at all. The lawlessness is... And this is just, you know, on brand for where we are as a people. The lawlessness is we finally have a president willing to do this so we can commit the lawless act of passing on people's debt to other people. Okay. <laughs> 
I... Okay. <laughs> the lawless act is not... I'll just... Anyway. That's Joe Biden for, I'm just going to do it anyway. Okay? That's not the lawless act. The lawless act is not doing what the Supreme Court says. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise. They're wrong. I don't care who they are. They're wrong. And believing otherwise is actually how we got into this mess. Largely. We let, the, we let the spirit of the age use the courts to impose things the culture was not ready to impose upon itself yet. Well, see, the funny thing is the culture now is ready to do it. <laughs> All right? And so um, with a few rare exceptions, we don't have the courts now stopping them from doing it our way. Oh, notice this always works one way typically. Okay? Um, that's not lawless at all. It's not. The lawlessness is that the president believes he has the power to forgive debts. Is that one of the enumerated powers of the uh, executive branch in the Constitution? Power to declare a year of jubilee? I don't know. A couple dudes threw some powder on it, so I don't know if we have access to that document anymore. Is that where the ACC grant of rights is? Those two things, you're not allowed to see either one of them? <laughs> Gosh. All right. Florida State found the Constitution before they got to see the, the ACC grant of rights. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, no, it, I'll, I'll, spoiler alert. No, uh, the president doesn't have the power to forgive debts. OK, it's not a power, especially because this debt is, is you're indebted to whom in this case, the government. Does the government have money? Does it does it have its own money, guys? No. Therefore, if, if Joe Biden is forgiving the debt, what he is doing is saying, those people aren't going to ha- they don't have to pay you back. This is theft actually. This is this is absolute act of, this is an absolute act of theft. That's the lawlessness. It isn't that he doesn't want to do what the Supreme Court told him to do. That's the scam. And too many on our side have bought into this for a generation. So while I I I am appalled at the application of it I actually agree with the premise of what Joe Biden is articulating. It would be just our look, right, Todd? It's kind of like we, you got to finally get a devoted Catholic president. And he's arguing for Cheney madness, right? Okay. Well, you had two. We shot one of them and the other one is arguing for Cheney madness. <laughs> yeah, the other guy slept around a lot too. Indeed. We're so not, We're not doing so We hard. finally got a president to say, I don't have to do what the court says. And it's to steal from us. So, you know... <sighs> 50% that's is that is that incrementalism 50% all right we're we're advancing the ball our premise is sound the application is to steal from us so that is not good all right but that's i think that's called incrementalism on the right isn't it sure or is it to not even get your premise and then still let the Democrats do what they want. And use the correct pronouns while you're doing it. Exactly. That's actually incrementalism on the right. I wish, I wish Daniel was here right now. He would have a field day with this. <laughs> well, you guys may have a field day now. Your thoughts? Uh, you know, a six boosted people are not going <laughs> to have any understanding of what you just said. They just... They, well, they already stole my endocrine system. They already stole my cardiovascular yeah, system. They already stole my immune system. I thought, <laughs> exactly. I thought this was just implied. I yes. Thought, yes. There you go. That's go America. Point. That's a good point. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, the Supreme Court technically didn't say that Joe Biden could not use the mechanisms he's using right now to forgive student loan debt. But uh, at the very least, I'm grasping for straws here. I I appreciate the sentiment of telling the Supreme Court to pound sand. Is that that kind of surmise surmise where you're at? Yes. By the way, whatever happened to the Texas border dispute? We don't talk about that. More in a moment. All right, back here on the Steve Day Show, we were talking yesterday, what we predicted at the start of the year, that uh, the regime would start pumping sunshine into the economy. 
and quote unquote uh, forgiving uh, student loan debt, which is stealing. Uh, but um, we're sitting on a glut in the housing market. And I'm telling you, you're going to see uh, mark it down. What's today? February 21, 22. You're going to see strong um, housing sales in the second and third quarter of this year. Mark it down. There's, there's just too many houses. Too, the, the inventory, there's too much of a glut. People are going to feel like they got to move. And they'll do a little bit, maybe one little soft interest rate cut to make you feel like suddenly it's Pleasant Valley Sunday all over again. And that's why when that happens, and people are going to want to say, maybe it's time to put my house up and see what I can get for it, or it's time to make that next move. Make sure when the housing market is reborn here in a couple of months, make sure you've got an agent you can trust. All right, go to realestateagentsitrust.com and find that agent, the best in your area, top sellers. They know the lay of the land, the best practices that'll get you and your family where you need to go, whether it's across the street, you know, uh, another neighborhood in your city or, you know, somewhere across the country. Uh, And a lot of these agents are fans of the blaze. So you're going to have a common value system with them starting out as well. Do your family and yourself a favor. Go to realestateagentsitrust.com. That's realestateagentsitrust.com. Dan Smithwick is with the Nehemiah Institute, uh, where they test and chronicle the sad state of the American worldview. And he is our guest now today on The Blaze. Dan, it has been too long, my friend. How you been, brother? I've been fine. You're right. It's too long. I was thinking, you know, was it in the early 2000s when I was in your office, in your studio with you? Yeah. And uh, I, we thought things were bad then. Oh, I know. Those were the days. Yes, those were the days, brother. The salad days where we could like win marriage amendment battles and referendums. Now we don't even know what a woman is, okay, with who the bride or the groom is. You're right. It was a simpler time, Dan. So that begs the question, what will it look like in another 10, 15 years? Well, I'm cutting myself contemplating it, Dan, so thank you. Uh, But uh, are you still in Minnesota or did you finally escape the People's Republic and get out of there? We did uh, in Florida, Sarasota, Florida for half of the year and then we're up in north dakota in the summers which is where i grew up all right so good for you all right so you and i met as you as you pointed out it was another you know era ago it seems um because i i was just getting serious about my faith i'm just getting serious about what it means to renew your mind and biblical worldview and this stuff and and i had heard about this thing uh, called a peers test And it fascinated me. Uh, I even uh, had you come into town and do a presentation for some of the people in the education community and the Christian education community I know. And I know some of those people actually, you know, took your recommendation seriously. So what is the peers test? What is it? It's a worldview assessment. You know, the term worldview is used widely these days, uh, which just means our basic outlook on life. So the peers test is an instrument that shows how we think or what we think is right in five spheres of culture, politics, by which we mean government, economics, education, religion, and social issues. And this assessment simply shows if uh, on a scale, if we are uh, in the biblical theism worldview category or all the way to the left in the socialist worldview category. That's what it is. I took your test last night. All right, I'm going to reveal my score. The, the test is 70 questions, okay, uh, that, that either do, each question either does or does not have a biblical worldview as the premise of the question. And then you answer strongly agree, tend to agree, neutral, tend to disagree, strongly disagree, okay? Because we're also testing not just, you know, um, your head knowledge, but your level of conviction here on, on how you answer these questions yes. as well. Yes. All right. And so here were the here were the scores that I got last night um, on conviction. I scored uh, this is from zero to 10 is the range on conviction. I scored eight point seven four and on consistency. I scored eight point eight. Oh, all right. So give good me scores. are those good scores? They are good scores. Anything above a seven and a half we say is good. We as Christians need conviction, and we need consistency. And that's been a weakness in the evangelical world. We're not consistent in our thinking about how life is supposed to work. We might do well in the religion category, but we're not thinking biblically in the other categories. So that's what those two indexes mean. 
by the way, the average score on this uh, on this iteration of the Pierce test, I know you've altered it, changed it, updated it over the years. So on this iteration of it that I took last night, the average conviction score is 7.62. That's pretty good, actually, which you've seen so sure. far. And, but, sure, and even strong secular humanists and socialists can have high conviction. There you go. Good point. Not all conviction is good. That's true. Um, <laughs> consistency is 6.39. So I, I scored um, above average in those two areas. Um, yeah. Then there were the summary results. Okay, yeah. on limited government, I scored an eighty-eight point two four. The average is only twenty-nine point yeah. nine nine. Okay, now you just hit on what we think is probably the most important index of peers testing, because what that's showing is what is our view of the duties of civil government, and it's where we get the highest scores and where we get the lowest scores. And I have become convinced that that particular measurement is all important because it's really saying, who do we think is in charge of these different things? Mm -hmm. And we are especially losing our youth in that index. Uh, when we had this test validated uh, using several biblical scholars who were I mean, heads of industries, write books and so forth, that was their highest score was the limited government index. They had an average score of 92 something. So you're right up there, my friend, uh, as no surprise to me. But uh, I just tested a Christian school in Georgia, evangelical school, limited government was negative 11. Oh my word. Oh my. That's, if we're turning out our kids. Macy, maybe Stacey Abrams really is governor of Georgia. Continue, Dan, go ahead. If we're turning out our kids in yeah. Christian schools with that view of civil government, we're in trouble. What is what is minus eleven? Is that I'm an extra on reds? I mean, what what is that? Yes. What what's minus yeah. eleven? So, okay, so the 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 peers range is is uh, minus one hundred to plus one hundred. We have a two hundred point spread. Anything below zero means you understand socialism and you believe it. Oh wow! And this was an evangelical school in Georgia. 150 students. On the composite, I scored a 78.86. The average is 46.13. What does that mean? So you're in the biblical theism category. That's where we want to see people. You have to know quite well what the scripture says about these five spheres, and you mark that you agree with it. And and that you uh, to get that kind of score, you have to mark, I strongly agree with mm -hmm. the right views, or strongly disagree with the wrong views. So that's where we want to see the evangelical world is in the 70 to 100 range. Only about 15% of our peers' audience over the last 35 years that I've been doing this is in that range. 15% of those. 15. 15. 15. And you're primarily testing Christians. Oh, 98%. 98% of whom you test are believers, and 15% of them you're not even asking people, you know, uh, th that's a pretty broad theological definition. Biblical theist. I'm not asking you, do you believe in progressive yeah, sanctification? Yeah. Are you are right, you, a, no. you a covenantal theology or a dispensationalist? You have to know no, what those no, terms so. are. Are you a no. biblical theist? You have to have the general knowledge of the word of God, the general stuff. General knowledge with basic principles of uh, free market versus, uh, you know, socialist control of economy. Uh, who's responsible for education? Uh, the flow of civil government, you know, do you believe in the Tenth Amendment? That's a question that deals with that. Uh, so these are basic worldview things that everybody has an opinion on. Mm -hmm. This is not a Bible knowledge test right. where you might not know facts right. in Scripture. This is how we think... You don't get, you're, you're, not, you're not being asked who the third judge of Israel was. Okay, you're not being asked that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like that. Nothing. Um. I, I, I struggled with your test more than I thought I was going to, and I want to tell you why. I, you know, mm -hmm. let, let me go double back here. I want to just, I want to reconfirm this point. So you've been at this for 35 years. How many, how many Christian school kids have you tested with this, would you estimate, over, the, over that time? 100, 120,000. Well over 100,000. Pretty good sample size. 1,000 schools. 1,000 schools across the country. All right. Yeah, so we have a lot of data and extremely validated. We went through several processes to validate this test. Otherwise, we couldn't work with universities, which we do. Yep. We've tested 30-some universities, Christian universities. 
Are there that many Christian universities? I'm sorry, but apparently not based on these scores, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you would say, and 15% scored biblically theist over the course of your work in this arena for the last 35 years, 15. That's how badly we have lost the meaning of the gospel in the evangelical world. See, this is even more, I think, specific. And, and you know, we, I've had George Barn on the show several times over the years. He does some great work. But he is, he, he is broadly testing biblical worldview of Christians in, in, in churches. You're specifically going to the institutions that are, that, whose charge, whose mission, prime directive is the teaching of a biblical, installing and instilling a biblical worldview. Your te- and your, they you, say, go ahead. And they say that on their websites. Right. So this isn't, hey, I, I grabbed, you know, there's 10,000 people at this suburban megachurch and I tested them. No, these are the Christian school kids who should be like our Navy SEALs, basically, right? They should be like the best of the best of the best. And imagine, now this might actually happen with today's Army, frankly, military, frankly. Imagine we had the best of the best. You found out only 15% of Navy SEALs yes. could pass yes. the physical requirements. Would you think... Uh Oh, I mean, that's essentially what you found testing our top institutions in the Christian world in America. That is exactly right. I'm just. Todd, find me something to cut myself with during the commercial break, please. It'd be an honor. Um, um, So the same school I was just talking about, 150 students, 60 some faculty. The teachers who are teaching these kids average score of 38 how do we fix this train wreck i i i don't if you're telling me that the institutions that are taking money from people to fix this are breaking it i i don't know what i don't know what how to fix that so this is why we created this new platform that you used last night Mm -hmm. specifically to get into churches to parents and grandparents or it's easy to use to get an instant scorecard, highly confidential, even I don't see personal results, Mm -hmm. to help them understand that we have been taken captive to hostile ideas. We're going to tell people before we let you go how they can get on this platform, and it doesn't cost a lot of money to take the test, by the way. Um, uh, We have a kind of a neat handle. We call it Worldview Checkup. Dot org. Worldviewcheckup.org. That's where you want to go. Worldviewcheckup.org. Right. We, I need to address pastors. We want pastors to have a conviction that they should do a worldview checkup on their congregation. Which is really a worldview check a checkup on um their doing their own job, essentially. Yes, uh, but yeah. exactly, exactly right. All and right. Yeah, you're, you're, we have a good American number. It costs seventeen seventy six. <laughs> good American number. <laughs> Well, now I'm wondering if people can count to 1776 looking at some of these scores. But uh, here's the here's the legit issue. At least I think it's legit. Maybe you don't uh, that I had with the test. There were a handful of questions that I completely agreed with uh, verbatim, every syllable. And then I looked at the people that the, the the crop of people that would be those who would actually do what is your question. And I thought to myself, well, in theory. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition, but I, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I want, you know, do I want those people making, you know, being the ones that are actually, you know, doing the stuff in your questions. You know what I'm saying? Like some of my issues from your questions were not from the left. They were from the right. They were, yes, they yes, were like, I yes. just don't know if I want people in charge in this, ge- like the capital punishment question. All right. Yes, I think every, exactly. I think every pedo, every groomer, every predator, if convicted, everyone all ought to be executed. Yes, yes. Do I, do I, do I, how many of the current people that would actually do that in our criminal justice system and state government do I trust to actually not say yeah. that you're a pedo and a groomer because you won't let us groom? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know how you score for that, but that was a struggle that I, real quick, that I had taken the test. Well, that's it. And that's exactly, uh, I'm glad to hear that because that's where the rubber meets the road is. Are we willing to apply these things that we have conviction about to how life is lived out on the street? Um, uh, this explains why there have been martyrs in church history. When you start putting it on the street, you're putting your life on the line. Yep. Let's leave it there. Worldviewcheckup.org is where people need to go, right? And it's just 1776 to take the test yourself. Have your kids take it, your grandkids take it. 
just 1776 worldview checkup all one word worldviewcheckup.org and and thank you dan for doing to me what i do to this audience most days now i know how they feel all right i i well, appreciate you. it thank you for having me on again steve good to see you <laughs> yeah it's good to see you too be well take care brother thank you thanks god bless you bye you too thoughts on that guys Feel like we need a moment of silence. <laughs> yes, and, and and maybe some Marlboro Reds. Okay, actually, maybe some. I uh, picked the wrong week to give up uh, amphetamines. Thoughts? Well, I was reliably told uh, by an Iowa pastor that in order to worship the baby Jesus at Christmas, we also had to worship the devil. So I'm, I was prepared, man. <laughs> I was well prepared. <laughs> I had, already, I had already had my hopes and dreams crushed, so I am at a place where I can accept this now. Yes. This actually dovetails perfectly with what we're going to do uh, in the next hour, because the final chapter of the Nefarious Bible Study, you talk about, you set the whole thing up by, like, we, we, we as Christians just pull our punches we don't let the lion out of its cage we you talk you talk it is the mightiest weapon we have and we're seemingly ashamed to use it mm. and once again the providential timing of this show did we know the final chapter when you were going to say that was when we were going to have him on no no we did not no. and he just told you no we prefer to bury that weapon deep in a hole yeah yeah and we're still digging in fact yeah we like shovels and as well as hammers and sickles Aaron. Conversations like that put the last eight years in better context. Oh, yes, they do. They surely do. Um, we need a control-alt-delete on this culture, on this country. Can we just unplug Even, the TV and plug it back in? Yeah. Does that work? <laughs> need a control-alt-delete. Um, Windows. Do, 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 do. Uh, we need that. We need a reboot. I think the spirit of the age understands this from the opposite because they're the ones calling for the great reset as well. Just from the other side of the looking glass, that's all. I think I need to self-medicate. Good thing we got a commercial break coming up. Back here with our two live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. I'm Steve Dace with Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you. Don't forget, you can let us know what you think about what we think via the stevedace.com inbox by emailing us, steve at stevedace.com, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter. Instagram and TikTok and Getter. You can also, if you're a podcast listener and wouldn't mind doing this for us, leave us a five-star review, please. We appreciate each and every one of you that have done that for us already. Also, make sure to hit subscribe or if you're on iTunes, follow. That way, if you do that, every time we do a new episode, it will show up automatically in your feed every single time. Also want to let you know, as we round out, this is, uh, we're getting to the end. We're got one more session next week where we'll kind of do a summary of the Bible study that we are concluding this week of Know Thy Enemy. My next book is coming out here on March the 5th. It is book two in my trilogy of books on America's Christian heritage. We did Why Thanksgiving back in 2022. This year we are doing Why Easter. Jesus died for us so we can live forever. Why Easter is releasing on Tuesday, March the 5th. You can pre-order your copy today at Amazon.com. If you'd like an autographed copy, those are available via Premier Collectibles at PremierCollectibles.com slash Why Easter. PremierCollectibles.com slash Why Easter. Or you can just pre-order your copy of Why Easter today at uh, Amazon.com. I got asked by one of the local Christian schools, by the way, today. Uh, to go, if I'd be willing to go and do a reading of why Easter at the school for the kids one day when we get off doing the show. And I kind of thought that was a cool thing. It's a very cool thing. Yeah. Plus, it, the, it, the school is located in Pella, which is my favorite city in Iowa. So it gives me an excuse to go there, too. So get some Dutch letters. Stop by the bakery. Yeah, yeah. got to do that. Got to make the pilgrimage. You bet. All right. Uh, so again, why Easter releasing on Tuesday, March 5th. You can pre-order your copy on Amazon today. Also... Theology Thursday today brought to you by our friends over at Jace Medical. Originally, they came on board because they were concerned that we were just 
blacklisting drugs that maybe could be quite useful during, you know, these uh, uh, d- this dangerous pandemic. Well, they wanted to make sure that the next batch of medicines that might be very useful for the next so-called emergency uh, would not have that happen to them. But now they're concerned about broader drug shortages that we're seeing as well. That's why they've expanded what they do now at Jace Medical. You can customize the Jace case with up to 294 medications. Uh, So if you've got a loved one that's on a fixed income or on assisted living, maybe they're just in a position uh, that that they just can't take care of themselves the way they used to. And and you're looking out for them. First of all, good on you. All right. That's I mean, that's an excellent character trait. Uh, But uh, this is one way that you can uh, have their back. You can gift them uh, one of these Jace cases or, you know, gift it for your family as well. Use the promo code Dace at JaceMedical.com to get a discount. That's J-A-S-E, J-A-S-E for JaceMedical.com. Promo code Dace for the discount at JaceMedical.com. And we continue on Theology Thursday with Know Thy Enemy and Nefarious Bible Study. Next week, we'll do one last summary of uh, the last six weeks we've done and and look ahead to how it may or may not have impacted the way uh, we see what's going on in the world. But, you know, Todd, you and I were talking during the break. When I laid out the Theology Thursday schedule for this year to you guys right around Christmas, we had no idea that Dan Smithwick from the Nehemiah Institute was going to be on the exact day that we were going to finish the study. But the back-to-back of the data that he shared with us, 35 years of testing, Christian, high, Christian school kids, Christian college kids, Christian school teachers, Christian college faculty, well over 100,000 he's, he's done this for. In the last 35 years, 15% scored biblically theist. 15. 15%. It makes a lot of what's in here. Doesn't it clarify a lot more, a lot of what's been in here that we've talked about the last five weeks? Yes. Session six. And again, we're assuming you saw the video version. If you're... Still, if you still want to do this, you can go buy this on Amazon right now. Inside each copy is a code that will give you access to the videos that Dr. Jeremiah Johnston from Prestonwood Baptist and I, we do that accompanies each of these sessions. They're really well done, courtesy of the team at 110 Pictures. Want to give them a shout out. This is session six. Let's pick it up as if you've watched the video. Session six, defeat thy enemy. Now go and do. I want to just start right there. Okay. Because we are living, we are living in an era where there is an eschatology prevalent that says things get worse no matter what we do. Now, I'm not here to question that eschatology on the merits of its uh, of its hermeneutic. I'll let other people do that. I've studied all of them. I'm, I know just enough to be dangerous. And carry a serious conversation. And I have my own complicated eschatological views. I am fascinated by the subject and fascinated by my inability to come up with really core convictions on it at the same time. (laughs) Okay. Um, And we've had shows in the past where we've had people come on who believe in this eschatology and they've laid out like in, in a full show or a full hour why they do. We'll do a show in the future where somebody who has a different eschatology will come on and lay out, you know, why, you know, he or she thinks differently uh, and thinks that eschatology is an error. I'm not here to debate the merits of that eschatology on their hermeneutical prep preface or premise. I, I'm, I'm pointing out though, that even it, We often act as if that means God is not sovereign now. Like there is a, I want to make sure we state this first. There is a distinction between saying God and his sovereignty has allowed the enemy a period of time to persecute, to engage in tribulation, as a means of judgment, as a means of testing to, well, I mean, this is the devil's playground. He's in charge. 
as if he is like a, as if, you know, he won a battle with God and the surrender terms were he got the earth. You see what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I am concerned at times that the language of that eschatology goes beyond we're, we're in an age of the church that the, that, that the great apostasy is going to occur, but God in his sovereign, in his sovereignty, what does Jesus say? If you believe in this eschatology, even the elect would be deceived. If God did not shorten the days, who's shortening the days? Who's shortening the days? God, which means if you're shortening the days that an event can take place, who is sovereign over that event? God. God. Like when your parents grounded you when you were a kid, Erzin, you did it again. You're grounded for a month. Could you just say, I'm going to shorten the days, Dad? We're going to do this. Four or five days seems reasonable to me. We're going to shorten the days. Were you allowed to do that? I was not. No, because you were not what? God. Yeah. You were not or sovereign. Dad. You're sovereign. So you were not sovereign over the home. Okay. Dad was. So when Dad said you were grounded for this amount of days, he would determine if you were or more or less. There was no, well, I have a, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm seeking a second opinion myself. It doesn't work that way. So even if you believe we live in an era of the church where the great apostasy will happen in our time, or we're heading towards a time where that will happen, that does not mean the enemy is in charge. Jesus says even the elect would be deceived if God had not shortened those days, God is sovereign always at all times in all things. Nor, and I think sometimes we adopt this because we feel maybe we need to bail God out. Well, Steve, if that's true, well, then this terrible thing happened. This, this natural disaster happened. This, this tragedy happened. And so then why did God allow it? Why didn't he stop it? See, that's actually the harder discussion to have. And that's where we get into questions of faith. Overall, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Have you seen enough of the goodness of God to trust that all things work together for the glory of God and for those called according to his purposes? And that allowing or permitting such a thing under the under him under his sovereignty permitting a certain amount of human will is not the same as actively doing that thing in my sovereignty as a parent i give my kid the keys to the car <clears throat> i i tell them don't drink and drive i didn't purchase alcohol for them i even put it in writing like i put it in a book once don't drink and drive Delivered it. Wrote it with my own fingertips like, like Moses said, God wrote the Ten Commandments. I delivered this to them. It's been made very clear to them. I don't think they should drink and drive, right? I've made it. There's no, nobody could debate this. You might call it a commandment. Correct. I hand them the keys and give them the car. They then make the choice to drink and drive. I, did I give them the drink? Did I tell them it was okay? Was I even, you know, uh, ambu was, was there amb any ambiguity about my thoughts on the matter? No, I, I made it patently clear. And they choose to do it anyway. Am I responsible for that? No. No, they, they made that choice. See where I'm getting? Okay. But I wanted to make that point before I hand it over to you guys to get your thoughts on the video and pick up the conversation from there. The enemy is not in charge. Never has been, never will be. Our theme this year is dominion. God is in charge. Always has been, always will be. If there has been in his if there has been a certain amount of dominion granted to the enemy for such a time as this, that is to also work out God's sovereign plan. The enemy didn't trick God, didn't outsmart God, didn't find an exception in the rule. He's, an, he's being used, like a tool would be, as a means to an end. It's being permitted. But the enemy's not in charge. 
you guys are welcome to comment on that or just go right into the video from here. Well, I'll do both. In terms of that sovereignty, for me, here is where I think the rubber really meets the rose, uh, road. Most, most Christians coming uh, to God are a version of the man who comes to Jesus and said, oh man, I'm ready to go. What's the game plan? What should we do? I, I, I love the cut of your jib. That, and, he, and he says to him, because he knows he's wealthy, go give everything away, everything that you have. And we know what happens with that story. All of a sudden, it's wah, 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 wah. He's like, oh, that's, that's not what I was talking about. That's most of us with faith and appreciation of sovereignty. Most people... Even, even orthodox conservative believers they don't understand the depths to which they have and, and this has everything to do with the worldview study they have they have turned the bible into their self-help manual mm -hmm. i.e i will come to it mm -hmm. on my terms mm -hmm. when i need it and mm -hmm. i think this is interesting in how you i, I think you get to that in how you uh, lay out uh, at the beginning on how, why, why we, uh, uh we pull our punches. We don't let the lion out of our cage. And you say what I just said in your way, talking about how, Hey, I'm sola scriptura, but you know, that doesn't mean you throw away all of church history before the time you happen to be alive. Right. And this People is were Christians before an Augustinian monk nailed yes. 95 theses to a, a college yes. bulletin board. And you yes. have very much, trust me, and I get this a lot of t people coming at me. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm unsaved uh, because I'm Catholic. I, I'm, I'm very confident that people saying this to me, living today, reading their Bible, would, would s say, what? stop talking to me about Augustine, Steve. He's... He's dead in his sins. He was Catholic because they've turned this into what I'm saying. I, and I'm not trying to use this the, it's explicitly Catholic Protestant. I'm simply saying if you if you simply approach Scripture that way, it's it it's it wasn't alive outside of your own utility. You're I don't you may as well just pick up, you know, the self help book. That's the New York Times bestseller on the shelf because so sooner or later, it's, you're, you're not, you are only willing to act on your terms. Th that's not the gospel. To Steve's point, it, we're, you, you are supposed to act and trust. And Steve's told that story about Moses over and over and over again. Be still and know that I am God. Is that you? Or do you only go to it on your terms and i think that says everything for why that weapon steve you talked about with jeremiah people bury it in a hole they 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 don't they only want to wield it in a way that benefits them when the greatest weapon that god ever gave us is it culminates in matthew 28 and wasn't there just a different study a while back that like how many people christians didn't even know what the great commission was yeah barna actually so, did that study a majority of christians didn't know what the great commission was yeah. that was a couple of years ago i mean yeah. you, that's a that's a go forth to all the world steve are, are we even willing to have a chat period i mean you said as much talking to pastor jeremiah christian on christian we aren't even willing to talk to each other like this anymore man there's a lot of stuff going through my head right now between one submission on the overtime yesterday from buy, sell, hold, the last segment, what we're talking about right now. But I think going to the, the study kit and um, talking about how do we defeat our enemy, and, and you use the example of uh, the devil's attempted temptation of jesus and of course jesus example is perfect to follow every time he was tempted quoting scripture you know um uh, pointing to who's really in in control and it's not satan it is god the father but the the boldest temptation they write coming from matthew 4 8 through 10 and again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and he said to them 
I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, go away, Satan, for it is written, again, quoting scripture, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And you go on to write in this study, one thing made Satan's offer attractive. Jesus also knew that the road he was about to travel would include pain, suffering, and death. Jesus could avoid all that if he accepted Satan's offer. It would mean the instant achievement of his goal without any of the suffering. In my mind, actually, and I'll explain why, my mind actually went back to this submission that we took in the overtime yesterday. If, if you don't mind, I throw it back up on the screen. It's from Sean Griffiths, and he's been submitting this for months, and it's so depressing that I never took it until now. And we discussed it yesterday in the overtime, and I understand what happens on the overtime stays on the overtime, except for this one uh, exception. And he has this 10 bullet points for his contention that the USA has already collapsed, and it's it's hard to argue. The reason why I didn't take this is because it's impossible to argue against any of these. No longer have a border, no longer agree on basic history, no longer have a deeply held beliefs, no longer have a shared language, no longer have true sovereignty, no longer have a constitution, one that we follow, no longer have a secure, legitimate election, no longer have equal protection of the law, no longer have geopolitical co cohesion, no longer have a nonpartisan military. After reading that, though, I was thinking about that after the show. There is one thing amidst all of that confusion and division. There is one thing I would contend that the vast majority of Americans, perhaps all Americans, do have in common, regardless of sex, regardless of background, regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic status. Can you guess what that one thing is in common that we all have in common? maybe perhaps uniquely as Americans, or at least Westerners. It's the love of comfort. Yep. And it's interesting, and, and I hadn't really made that connection between Satan's boldest temptation of Christ, Christ knowing the road that lie ahead. that He could essentially, now he could not because he's God, but if we were in his shoes, the choice between comfort or at least avoidance of pain and suffering versus the road that we are called to be upon. And I go back to the segment last that we did last segment. What was the number? 15%? 15. Of, of uh, people that um, Mr. Smith, uh, Smithwick has, has taken um, or, or distributed the peers test to actually came back with a functioning worldview where the rubber meets the road I would posit something to you and it's difficult to accept as Americans with our intact heritage that 15% praise the Lord actually not Is that, that, that high still well not necessarily that but we were we were told the road is narrow this is just a fulfillment of that. The United States ultimately will maybe end up being a blip on the radar of human history in terms of what it was as it was founded. But ultimately, we're always told that the way is narrow. 15% versus 85%. Somebody tweeted <laughs> during the break, what was the number of, of Americans who um, got at least one dose of the COVID jab. It was about 20%. Uh, yeah, about 85%. Oh, I'm sorry, 80, 81, about 85%. 85%, somewhere yeah. around there. Yep. The road is narrow. Um, American, adult, is, American adults, American I should adults, clarify. Yeah. Yeah. The road is narrow. He's told us it would be narrow. He's given us the tools. Jesus' example leads the way. So, to put it in that context, yes, the road ahead will be filled with treachery for a lot of us. Maybe let's just go ahead and say, if you're really on the narrow road right now for all of us, it will be filled with pain and suffering. The choice we'll have is the choice that Satan attempted to give Jesus. Comfort, avoidance of suffering, or the narrow road. That's the choice before all of us. I... Uh 
there's there's one I think common denominator here, and that is the need to understand and know the Word of God. We haven't talked about this on the show in, in several years, but one of the things we used to uh, reference on the program is what I call three dimensional thinking. You guys remember this? It's been yeah, yep. it's been a, it's been a few years since we have done this. The first dimension is a biblical commandment. The first dimension is to know why you believe what you believe. That's a biblical commandment. Peter writes in one of his epistles to always have or always offer reasons for the hope that you have. And the Greek word that he uses there for reasons is apologia. That's where we get the term apologetics from. Now, a lot of times apologetics means like, and he gets us ad apologizing for believing Christianity. That's not what apologetics means. Okay. That's what it means in a, too many of contemporary American churches, but that's not actually what it means. It means a ready defense. You come at me with challenges to my faith. I have answers. I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind. I've been discipled. I've been catechized. Unfortunately, many of our churches won't do that in this age. That, does that mean, though, you are off the hook then as a believer? Well, no. you know, the church. No. That, that's not what it means. You were individually saved. You were individually made. You are being individually sanctified. So you are individually responsible. Have a little less hobby time then. I, I, I mean, I, the... I took years. I tried to emulate what I read Paul did. Went to like Arabia for like three years. And the dude comes back and he's like, you know, a freaking superhero. Okay. I, I, I took years after I got converted. I read everything I could. I watched everything I could on Christian television, which I would not frankly recommend. With a few exceptions. Trying to figure out what, you know, what's right, what's wrong. It dawned on me one day, guys, you know, maybe if this is, if this is, if this is my whole, if this is the plumb line of my life, maybe I should know as much about this as I do the minutia of Michigan football history. Like I can instantly tell you what happened in the 1970 Michigan football season. And I wouldn't even be born for several more years yet. Only makes sense that maybe I should know more as much about this. As I do eighties music, star Wars trivia, Lord of the Rings fair. Yep. And yeah. Maybe I should know at least as much as I do about those things. So I, I dug in. You could do the same. The second dimension, and that's a commandment, by the way. There are, what you're going to find in the New Testament is there are really very few things post-salvation that we are commanded to now affirmatively do. That, that's one of the struggles learned people have with Christianity. Wait a minute, this guy, Jesus died for my sins, rose again, and I believe that. And that, and he, he then comes into my heart, changes my life from the inside out. There's no incantations to memorize, no mantras. There's, there's no codes. That, that's kind of it. Well, it's, it's more than that. But yeah, that's it from the, the, the foundation. Everything else you'll do will be from that foundation. And it will not, to, it will not be under the premise of earning the favor of God but showing how much you are grateful for the favor he's already shown. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. That's what that means. My life is not my own. I'm so grateful for what God did for me. Do with me as you will. Like Isaiah the prophet said, here I am, Lord, send me. That's a commandment, though, to renew your mind. And your church may suck, and unfortunately, when it comes to discipleship, most churches these days do. That's not an excuse. Makes it harder. I'm sorry. I'm doing everything I can for two hours a day on a podcast and throughout much of my career, frankly, to supplement that as a pretty jacked up, screwed up layman. I'm doing my best to, you know, fill some of those shoes. But in the end, that's your responsibility for you. And your walk, as it is for me and mine. Second dimension. Know why other people believe what they believe. 
A lot of people heard about Vivek Ramaswamy and Hinduism. What is, do you know what they believe? What do other denominations within Christianity believe? Why do they believe it? Because if you know where people are coming from, if you do the first and you know why you believe what you believe, now we've laid a foundation. If you know why, if, if you know why other people believe what they believe, now we have empathy. Did I say sympathy? No. We're just, we're washing, we just wash the feet of unrepentant sinners and never ask them to repent. That's sympathy. That's the, that he gets us at is sympathy. That's not biblical. Empathy is understanding where people are coming from. Doesn't mean you identify with it. Doesn't mean you indulge in it. Doesn't mean you join in it. That's how tolerance is defined these days by joining in it. That's not what empathy is. Empathy, though, is understanding that. So there's a human connection. I can love my neighbor as I love myself if I can empathize with why you think the way you do. And then the third dimension, now we have a foundation. We have empathy. Now we can get into persuasion. What do other people think? Why do other people believe what they believe about what I believe? Because now I know what I think. I know what you think. And now I'm ready to, I'm ready to, ch to answer the challenges you have to my thoughts. The fallacies you have about what I believe. That's the best spiritual warfare you could ever practice right there. Not the only, but the best. All other spiritual warfare would be derived from those three things. We'll come back. We'll do three non-political questions next. Well, after some of the things we've uh, talked about today, maybe a nice glass of red wine would do you well. Our friends over at Bonner Private Wines can help you. They've got an outstanding stable of wines. Uh, many of them uh, you can get for 50% off. And with free shipping, you can get their exclusive, highly rated Sunai Illogico Malbec as well. That's uh, one of their absolute uh, best-selling exclusives. Uh, highly rated, 91 points third highest vineyard in the world, 10 times more resveratrol, 93% less sugar, and uh, phenomenal taste. Just uh, one of the great products they have at Bonner Private Wines, but you got to be a member of their partnership. BonnerPrivateWines.com is where you can go. B-O-N-N-E-R. BonnerPrivateWines.com is where you can go slash Steve. BonnerPrivateWines.com slash Steve. Once again, BonnerPrivateWines.com slash Steve. Time now for three non-political questions. We all have questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Who am I? A search and a question of identity. Why am I here? A question of meaning and purpose. Where am I going? Question of destiny. Some better than others. What sort of morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? Injecting some levity into the demise of Western civilization. It's three questions on the Steve Day Show. And there she is. The very, now very, very pregnant Anastasia, my firstborn, who is, you're ready to drop a human now, aren't you? You're ready. It's, we're ready now. Yeah. I feel like maybe last week I was still afraid of the pain. I still am. I still have fear. Yeah. But now the fear is being overshadowed by let's, every night when I go to bed. I'm like, wake me up in pain, please, dear God. Yeah, yeah right. but the contracts begin. <laughs> well, let's get the contractions done. begin. Yes, the contracts will begin too. <laughs> yeah. You'll find that out as well. All right, all right. So you got three questions for us, sweetie. Fire away. I do. So my first question is actually from Aaron. So this is a question that Aaron suggested that I asked. Okay. So this one is: If the Apostle Paul were alive today, would the American Church even get a letter? <laughs> would he even get a letter? Wow. I think we would get a letter. Yeah. I, I, I mean, there's, there's too much still Christian identity tied into this country. 
too many churches. Um, and, and, and too much worldly influence to not address it at all for sure. But I mean, I, I can see where the question would come from. I mean, cause we're, you want to talk about an Esau level of squandering of your birthright. I mean, that, that's, that's really what's going on in our era. Yeah. Especially if you go back to the conversation we had last hour with Dan Smithwick at the Nehemiah Institute. So, uh, I think that letter though, I mean, would it be a short letter? Would it be, would it be like repent, I, I, <laughs> turn or burn? Would it be something like stupid Galatians? I, I, I wrote this and I'm not rewriting first Corinthians again. Stop it. Would it be something like that? You know? Um, but I, I, I definitely think there would be some form of address. I have to tell you guys, um, your mom, uh, my wife has been, uh, listening to old Billy Graham sermons. And when I say old, it's just cause you know, he died. What was it? Uh, six, seven years ago now. So, I mean, we're talking sermons from, you know, these aren't from like the 1800s or early in his ministry. She was listening to one the other day. And I mean, he's just, this was like in the eighties. And I, I know that you've all been sold similar to Jesus. That Jesus is just this uh, hippie soothsayer life coach who tiptoes between the, the tulips of, Ju- of Judea, tossing and dispensing dime store, you know, affirmations. Okay. And that's not what you read when you read the scriptures at all. Just the opposite, in fact. Uh, similarly, um, this notion that Billy Graham is, is the proto- um, he was the, uh, John the Baptist of seeker friendlyism. He was the forerunner. He announced it, that this is the path, make a straight path for, for the softer side of Sears. And I've been listening to these Billy Graham sermons that your mom's been listening to dude. Oh my. I mean, dude is just, just dropping dimes, man calling out very calling out very specific sins in the culture at that time like specifying them you will go to hell for this if you don't just just like out loud saying it you know and i'm just like this is this was not the message at my sweater vested uh, uh you know uh, mega church last weekend it's completely and and who did more by the way who did more in the 20th century to individually did more to, sh- to share spread and, 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 and allow himself to be a vessel to bring the a biblical worldview and the gospel into the mainstream of society who did more in the 20th century than Billy Graham did. It's it, if there's somebody, it's a small list, man. It's a real small list. And, and he is preaching sermons that are just, and these people are like eating it up, you know, answering altar calls. I mean, you'd get booed and hissed from your average megachurch today if you preached. I, I can't even imagine what would happen if you walked into your average megachurch and just started reading the text of a Billy Graham sermon. And or didn't the tell Bible. Him, yeah, well, <laughs> that'd be a nice change of pace. But just, you know, and, and oh, and by the way, these, this is, what do you guys think of Billy Graham? Nice guy. Yeah. Everybody loved Billy Graham. Here was a message he gave in 1981. It would blow people's minds. Blew my mind, actually. Listen to it. Todd? Uh, well, we're just the, back to the fundamental question. Would we even get a letter? Uh, listen, we, we keep saying it over and over again. All three of us are on the same page. It, it would. I, it's so obvious that uh, it would be something about um, how spoiled we are, how comfortable we are. I, I mean, I don't, we're, we're, we're utterly stuck in our desire to somehow have a faith and have it ask nothing of, of us. I think it would, you know, it, it would be clearly something along those lines. We would get a letter and most of the churches would not even preach on it or read it. Hopefully, I mean... I'm the last two segments have kind of broken me a little bit. So maybe I hear you. Maybe I should come back and, you know, answer that later. But I think we would get a letter. We would not exactly like the contents of the letter. This will cheer you up. Headline from the Babylon Bee. 
wife frustrated that husband doesn't realize she wants him to be quiet <laughs> and also talk to her and also leave her alone and also come talk to her. <laughs> That's been Stephen's <laughs> life over the course of these nine months. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> so, there's a good laugh. All right, question two. Also, I have to say really quick, because I was watching Buy, Sell, or Hold yesterday, try the poppy sodas. Olipop sodas are bad. Okay. Poppy sodas are very good. All right. I just had to put that in there. Poppy sodas. P-O-P-P-I. Like, okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Okay. Second question. What is a Bible passage that you guys find encouraging that you want to share with other people to continue to encourage them in their battle against kind of the spirit of the age as they battle through things? I'm, I'll just make it, I'll keep it simple and go to the, uh, this year. And I've switched up in the past. We, it's, we, we've done Isaiah 61 in the past. We've done Ephesians 5.11 in the past. Uh, we, did, we did John 3.17. Uh, for the last several years, I switched it up at the beginning of this year to Romans eight twenty eight, because it's the it's the ultimate affirmation um, of the sovereignty of God. And I I mean I I think that I think Romans is the is the greatest book of the New Testament. I think it might be the greatest theological work in the history of this planet. Um, I think Romans eight is its greatest chapter. Um, it's it's soaring levels of rhetoric it's it's churchillian you know it's the theological equivalent we will fight them on the beaches i mean that kind of thing i mean it's that kind of a chapter and uh and i mean one of the culminating phrases that that paul uses there all things work together for the glory of god and for those called according to his purposes you know that that ultimately there is a plan ultimately there is a planner and he has a good plan and he is a good planner and he can be trusted and he's undefeated um he cannot be defeated the grave cannot hold him he speaks worlds into existence he cannot be stopped he cannot be contained he has no equal he has no rival he stands alone and through christ you can stand with him and i think that that is something that is very much needed because I think that is where our courage will come from. It will not come from, um, you know, uh, human striving or um, our own forms of bravery and courage can only take us so far. Um, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to, um, I'm going to do the good version of Nimrod version of this won't work. And so I would choose that scripture. Todd? This, I'm sure somebody's going to say this is a perfect vinegar answer, and I'm not... Uh, not that there's anything wrong it, with that. It is or it isn't, but I honestly, it's, 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 it's when Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. And when he promises his disciples that if, they, if I suffered like this, what do you think is going to happen to you? And I don't... Helping people with a lot of flowery nonsense in a time when they are called to act biblically. I just, it, it, it's clear our attempts at doing that. This is kind of Steve's uh, Jeremiah speech. I know the plans for you. Mm -hmm. I mean, but look around we, th uh, that passage. We, we need to be reminded that we are as modern day Christians, they honest, they need to be reminded there's going to be hard times, but also simultaneously put into context. Uh, do you expect to be actually physically crucified in the next 48 hours? Okay, then the cross that you're being asked to bear, probably doable. Uh, th this is a psychology and, and emotional intelligence that the modern day Christian just sorely lacks because, again, they're too comfortable. It just way, way they, it, it, it is the great lie of our times. So I'll say this because it's fresh in my mind because we're going through the book of Nehemiah at, at church. And I'm just reminded how rich that story is. Nehemiah hears of the walls in Jerusalem uh, being reduced to, to rubble and burned. And after months of praying, 
He literally risks his neck asking King Artaxerxes, hey, can I go back and build these walls? He comes back, and you know the story of Sanballat and Tobias. Sanballat is basically the Draco Malfoy, and Tobias is basically Crab or Goyle, and they're starting to jeer the Jews as they're rebuilding the walls, and they even threaten to take physical action against them. And Nehemiah equips his people, arms his people, and eventually says, to, and, and by the way, the story, uh, the, the accounts of those involved in the building is just incredible as well, because it's not just, hey, you think of uh, general contractors all over the place. No, it's goldsmiths. It's very specific uh, tradesmen. It's, there's, there's one account of daughters helping build the wall. It's just an account of how no matter who you are or what your skill set is, there's always, there's always something that God has for you to do, to act, to work. But eventually... The people had heard the criticisms, the, the jeering of Sanballat and Tobiah. They started literally singing a song as they were building, essentially, oh, yeah, they're right. We're never going to build the wall. As they were building the wall, we're never going to get this wall built. And eventually, after the threats of physical violence, Nehemiah arms them and says, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. And then a few verses later, this account has said, those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that they labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon in the other. Hmm. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. Hmm. Go back and read Nehemiah. If, I, I after, the last, after the last hour of this program, go back and read Nehemiah. If you need a uh, some wind beneath your wings. Love that book. All right, question three will be lightning around after we remind you about our friends at New Founding. Uh, you want to be depressed even more? Go watch old sporting events from the 80s on, on YouTube that have the commercials intact and just look at the way uh, businesses marketed themselves compared to what happens today. I mean, that'll, that'll have you hiding sharp objects. All right, clearly there has been a, re a, color, re a color revolution in corporate America. That's where new founding comes in. Uh, they want to help the, uh, the spirit of the American entrepreneur to remain free now more than ever. Uh, they want to help the best founders in America walk away from corrupt corporations uh, and also corrupt with wokeness and DEI and ESG. That's what new founding is all about. They're investing in companies that want to go back like Tyson likes to say, uh, and they do that through their venture fund. The, the, co the companies they invest in are defined by a simple question. Uh, does the country we want to live in need the company this person is building? If you can want to join them, uh, and venture investing isn't for everyone, but if you're a serious accredited investor who wants to see a more hopeful future for the country, go to newfounding.com backslash venture fund and apply to be an investor today. That's newfounding.com backslash venture fund, newfounding.com backslash venture fund. All right, lightning round. What is a biblical story that has never been made into a movie that you would love to see as a film? Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to go with, wow, I got to think about that's never been made into a film, even a bad film, like never yeah, been made. Yeah, that's never been made into a movie. Um, how about a film depicting one of Paul's letters? One of his, one of his epistles and what was going on in the culture and those kinds of things at the time that he was writing about and what he had to say about them. That would be really cool. Todd? Mm, ah, gosh, I think... Pick just about uh, any woman of the Bible. I think the timing of that in this day and age when we don't know what a woman is, uh, th there are remor remarkable... Uh, women who would, um, I mean, laid, I mean, heck, how about the book of Ruth? That's I something for you. They've never done a, a movie on that. That would blow my mind if that's yeah. never been done. Hmm. Okay. How about a story, a movie about the life and times of Elijah, the prophet? That's, that's Marvel superhero kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah. That'd be cool too. Just mocking. Mm -hmm. No, maybe your God's taking a dump. Maybe he's on the toilet. Just mocking it right to their face. I kind of like Aaron's idea. I think I think what we really need is that, actually. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Princess. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to stick around and do overtime for Blaze TV subscribers for the rest of you. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, Romans 828.